Good morning, everyone. Good morning, our friends on Zoom, our friends here. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Jen Cole. I am the Dean here at PNCA. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our very first ever University Civic Commons celebration. Um, we have staff, we have students, we have faculty, we have board members and community members um, joining us all day on Zoom and in person. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about what we mean by Civic Commons and what we're hoping to accomplish today. Um, we know that our uh, democracy, our civic institutions, our relationships with each other are very fraught at this moment. Um, and that if democracy and the promise of an even better and more equitable democracy than we currently have is to survive and thrive and continue to evolve, that we have to have the skills, tactics, and tools to be able to facilitate civic dialogue, civic action, um, and civic transformation. Um, we think here at PNCA that artists and designers have unique skills and aptitudes to make that current and future reality happen. Um, and today um, we're celebrating with our colleagues across the university, um, tr trying to imagine ways historians and economists and data scientists and artists and designers can work together towards this um, beautiful, more equitable civic future. And so today we will have a series of big idea sessions, um, which will kick off throughout the day where we'll bring in um, leaders from our region and around the country who are leading change in really big and dynamic ways. Um, and then from 12 until 1 today, we will have a series of what we're calling lightning talks, which are very fast um, presentations from students, faculty, um, and staff and community members who are doing this work in real time and who are um, talking about their applied um, action and research. And then at lunchtime on both campuses, we will have um, a uh, project showcases um, where community organizations and student clubs who are focused on kind of civic engagement and change um, can actually meet and connect with one another. So we hope that you find something that works for you. Um, this is meant as a drop in and drop out day so people can participate where and when they can. Um, and we're just thrilled that you're here. Um, I am so grateful that PNCA has many, many wonderful community partners, um, some of whom you're going to hear from today. But right now I'm going to turn over um, to uh, Megan gilligan Kane to introduce our speakers. But before I do that, I would be greatly remiss if I did not thank Megan and Issa Ramos, and Michael Cohen, and Danny Broderick, um, and the entire team who's actually helped present today, which has been not a small undertaking to do a simultaneous event um, in both campuses. So I just wanna thank our internal team and I'll turn it over to Megan. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Megan gilligan Kane, the Assistant Director for Public Programs and Events here at PNCA at Willamette. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our first big idea session. Um, this is the first in a series of critical conversations throughout the day where we can learn together about the important work happening at the intersection of creative practice and positive social change. Our intention is to create a common space where students can engage with new ideas around social justice and civic participation, socially engaged creative practice and research, and think about their own potential as creative catalysts for building communities where justice and care are guiding principles. It is my absolute honor to introduce today's speakers, the founders and leaders of Don't Shoot PDX and the Black Gallery, Ty Carp Carpenter and Teresa Rayford. Ty and Tressa are educators, activists, community organizers, cultural producers, catalysts for inclusive arts programming, curators, archivists, the list goes on and on. They are also our PNCA neighbors here in the North Park Blocks with the Don't Shoot PDX organizing annex and the Black Gallery just down the street on Northwest Flanders. The work that Teresa and Ty are doing in these two spaces plays a critical role in bridging arts and activism here in our city hosting incredible public programming centered on community art and education for liberation. Known for community art projects and powerful liberation installations, Don't Shoot PDX has envisioned a space in the Black Gallery where art is made available for social change. 
In addition to being a black owned and curated space, the Black Gallery focuses on promoting arts and education as a way to build community and support activist voices. With a dedication to building a more inclusive and diverse society, the Black Gallery showcases a range of artists whose work addresses social justice issues and explores themes of identity, culture, and history. By providing a platform for independent artists, the gallery seeks to create a space for dialogue and reflection about the experiences of underrepresented communities. In addition to exhibitions, the gallery provides educational programs, workshops, and events that engage visitors of all ages in exploring the connections between art and social justice. Through its innovative programming and commitment to inclusivity, Don't Shoot Portland has long been a vital cultural hub in the community, and the Black Gallery continues to promote new voices that advance social change. And with that, I'd like to turn over the mic to our wonderful guests, Teresa and Ty. This is the... Thank you so much. Really appreciate being here. Hi, my name is Ty, uh, Tyshana Carpenter. I'm the board president of Don't Shoot Portland, and I'm also the lead director at the Black Gallery. And I'm Teresa Rayford, Ty's mom, and also the founder of Don't Shoot Portland and gallery owner, Stuart. And thank y'all for having us. I'm speechless after all that stuff. That makes <laughs> wow, this sounds like a lot of work, and, and it actually is, but we couldn't do it without community. We call the work that we do in regards to art and education and social change, uh, community action plans and community art projects. So thank you for being a part of our work. The title of our talk today for your civic commons is uh, Art and Activism, a conversation about the power of art as a catalyst for activism, community building, and social justice. Oh. <laughs> Just a little pause here. Try to advance the screen. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Who we are. Don't Shoot Portland is a community action plan. This means that we believe that everyone has a place in organizing for social justice. Teachers, artists, students, lawyers, hospitality workers, and more have joined us on the front lines to mobilize support for the intersecting disparities that we all face. We do this by building community together, whether it's a teach-in to raise awareness on civic issues or art making events that amplify movements around the world. When we learn how unfair policies affect ourselves and our neighbors, we can come together to right the wrongs that we see. And then I also wanted to include photos of our previous programs, uh, some of our call to actions. And this is actually from Juneteenth, 2021, uh, at one of our children led marches uh, for Juneteenth. It's a photo from the Black Gallery, which as Megan mentioned, we are a neighbor to you all. We're about two blocks away, maybe three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and this was our inaugural show, uh, the very first show that we put on. Um, in April of last year. And it's about to be one year anniversary for us as well, being in that space as the Black Gallery. So uh, please look out for more to come on a little celebration and a little neighborhood gathering. Um, and we also have shows that are currently on display that you can visit leading up to that anniversary. What we do. Don't Shoot Portland demonstrates solidarity with those affected by pol police brutality, violence, and racial injustice by mobilizing direct action and man maintaining grassroots networks of mutual aid. We provide critical services like free food distributions, school and art supplies year round, while also giving direct access to legal services, emergency housing, and vital family services for vulnerable and marginalized communities. 
Our art events allow important community issues to be amplified through social engagement and outreach. This work is inherently informed by our perspective and lived experience as Black women. Our identity is integral to this work as activists, artists, and organizers. Black women face multiple forms of discrimination and marginalization based on race, gender, and other intersecting identities such as class, sexuality, and ability. It's through this work, through this lens, that our work sheds light on the complexities of oppression to find creative pathways to liberation and empowerment. And this is also another reason why it feels like an honor to be here. Uh, March, of course, is Women's History Month. Um, and we're just very proud of our community for being able to support us in the work that we do. And we're also wanting to um, uplift that work for ourselves so that we can keep it going. Thank you. <laughs> this is another photo of the Black Gallery. The power of public art. Every installation we've produced has become a hub for our social justice communities. We've seen firsthand the power of art in connecting those in need with community support, as well as being able to foster dialogues between intersectional struggles. When people are supported through art, their message can reach the audiences it needs to, whether it's those whose lives are directly impacted by the themes on display, or advocates and patrons looking for a way to create systems of care in the art world. Ultimately, we want this work to act as a blueprint for future generations mobilizing in their own respective movements, allowing it to shine as a spotlight to the relevance of bringing art and history into current conversations for social change. Organizers are met with opposition, anger, and sometimes physical violence on the front lines. Art has always been a vehicle for communicating through social movements, standing the tests of time by allowing future generations to fully understand historic revolutions. Liberated Archives is Don't Shoot Portland's way of making systemic violence against Black Americans visible and undeniable. It becomes a barrier of protection and communication in the face of bigotry. In this series, we include learning materials within the exhibit that community members are encouraged to immerse themselves in. QR codes linking to our data spreadsheets also allow more opportunities for self-learning. Art is for social change. Learning the root causes behind systemic issues we fight today promotes education and meaningful participation within social justice movements. There are many biases that come up in organizing spaces. Looking to historical archives will not only expand your understanding of a particular timeline of injustice by reading others' triumphs, struggles, and obstacles, but it will strengthen your ability and how you show up. Your work as an activist is meant to build upon the continued progress paved before you by movement leaders who are no longer with us. By uplifting and centering these stories, we use art as the powerful and transformative tool it is meant to be. And thank you. I think I sped through that a little more than I expected to. <laughs> These are uh, some of the socials that you can find us at the Don't Shoot PDX on Instagram and Facebook and the Black Gallery is also on Instagram and there's our two websites. Um, if there's a Q&A, we can do that as well. And then I also forgot, I put these in the wrong order. This should have been before that. So excuse me, I was up late working on this. And, uh, but for spring 2024, this is our programming that we have going on. Um, Liberated Archives, as I mentioned, is a series that we do of installations, 
Um, the material changes based on the research and what we're trying to spotlight in that particular, even the if it's like an on-site installation, we also take that context into consideration when we're building the research out. So it's become a series, and this Liberated Archives in particular has been done at the Clark Library at the University of Portland. We have an opening reception tomorrow um, from 4 to 6 p.m., but the show will be up through May. Uh, if anyone would like to see that, it's a very interesting uh, collection of work and research, and we worked with their social justice capstone and public fellows uh, to complete the work. Uh, right now at the Black Gallery, we also have a show by Adrian Cruz called Power Prayer for the Community. Uh, it is also in collaboration with the Portland Art Museum and the current exhibition at Black Artists of Oregon. Um, it is going to be on display through April 21st, and we are going to be celebrating first Thursday with you all um, on April 4th. I say 4 to 6 p.m., but, you know, sometimes it can go until 7. So if you're able to pull yourselves away from PNCA and some of the other things on the side of the block, <laughs> come up and check it out and see some of her work. Um, it's actually spanning, spanning 33 years. So some of the works are from um, very early beginnings. Some of them are from as recent as 2024. And uh, it's a very beautiful show. Uh, Policing Justice is another exhibition that we are a part of. Um, it's over at uh, Portland Institute of Contemporary Art. Uh, I know there's been a lot of incredible overlapping uh, events already with PNCA. So a lot of you may have already gone to PICA. The opening events were incredible and there's been some great panels as well. Um, but tomorrow, or tomorrow, Saturday on March 23rd, we do have a workshop happening there as well uh, from 4 to 8 p.m. And it is a workshop in collaboration with Mika Martinez, who is a movement photographer who's been documenting, uh, in particular, our work um, for since you know the last several years. I'm not going to try to give it an exact date, um, but she's going to be focusing on uh, artists, power and practices. So uh, consent, integrity, uh, uplifting movements and doing it in a very uh, intentional way and just sort of having an open floor for people to have a dialogue and connect with other creatives as well. So that'll be a very interesting workshop if you can make it. And we also have the memory work for Black Lives Plenary, uh, April 12th and 13th. It's going to be done uh, through our partnership with the University of Oregon and their special collections library. And it'll be held at their Portland campus, the White Stag. So not too far from here, uh, on both days, we're gonna start the workshops out with a hands-on archiving and preservation session with archivists from the City of Portland Archives. Um, all attendees will leave with an archival kit. Everyone will be welcome to bring in a couple of items as well. And you can join us in doing sort of that hands-on session before getting into the talks for the day, which we have um, Tracy Drake from Reed College. Um, they are also part of a collective called the Blackivists. Um, they're incredible search, uh, researchers in Black memory work and also uh, archiving and preservation. And we also have uh, Holly Smith from Spelman University who is coming in and she's one of their di uh, digital lead librarians and archivists and it'll be an incredible day of just uh, talking about community preservation and the importance of it. So sounds spread up everyone's alley. Um, <laughs> please take a picture if you'd like, or just capture this in your brain, and maybe uh, you'll join us at one of these, because we do have a lot going on. Thank you. And this information is also on our website, which is don'tshootpdx.org, so hopefully you can join us, and all of these events are free to the public, so register and share the information. All right, I think we're going to open it up to some questions. Um, and Tressa and Ty have also prepared um, prepared a prompt for our attendees to think about. Um, would you like to start with the prompt or questions? Let's start with the prompt so they can think about it. Is it this one? Um, how have you used your art? Uh, somebody's handwriting is <laughs> To make social change possible. <laughs> So that's the problem. Uh, how have you used your art to make social change possible? Just you can think about that and then, you know, let us know either in the chat box or by raising your hand here and Megan or Issa will come to you and get that information. 
Um, and also, if you have any questions, we'd love to answer your questions. I was going to say, if you also want us to go back to any of the images and like talk about what's going on in those pictures, um, we'd love to kind of break down how we're using art and archives to kind of build social change in our communities and what these documents are. So, but any questions in the chat or statements? Okay. And then you all can just repeat the question when yes. it's answered. All right. And so you said you don't have any now? I have questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, for young emerging artists and students who want to make their work align with social change a little bit more, can you talk about maybe some places they can start for learning how to bring together archives and research and making art? Yes, and um, I'll just repeat that question. It's for young, uh, um, you know, thriving artists that are emerging. Um, how do they use, um, what do they use in order to kind of connect or intersect social change to their art? And I would always direct you to the library. Um, I think that the more research you do, there's art books that are out there and there's also historical content that is out there in the libraries. And I think that a lot of the inspiration that we get for the pieces that we develop and the installations that we bring to life, um, that information comes to us through our partnership with life historians, special collections librarians, uh, anthropologists, um, now social media, obviously there's a lot of uh, really impactful people using TikTok and Instagram uh, to show uh, things that have happened in history. But I find a lot of access um, to inspiration in books and thoughts that people have shared through published writings. Um, and sometimes you might find them within your own family dynamics if you're looking for things that happen that connect your family to the social uh, ills of the times. Um, it's really good to look in like photo albums or scrapbooks and really to kind of retrieve items from there when you go to them. Um, in 2017, I spoke at a conference with the Society of American Archivists and we told them that we're in crisis mode because of social media. You know, we're putting all of our images and all of our thoughts uh, in these clouds and in these different spaces that might not always be there. And I think that it's important for us not only to document in real life uh, some of these images and some of these thoughts, but it's also important to start retrieving things that we remember from childhood. Um, when I was a kid, my grandmother for the holidays would bring out the photo albums and she also had envelopes from Kodak that had pictures that we as kids could put in the photo albums and could actually catalog and in inventory. So we would be writing down the names of our relatives, um, but over time you forget. <laughs> and then how do you share that information with the next generation? And so libraries and photo albums, I think is where artists can find the most inspiration. And I think it's critical that they look for that. I agree completely. And I would also say, um, just to echo that, definitely libraries, and in my experience, librarians are very helpful um, in researching things like that and being able to request information. Um, similar to when you go to the City of Portland Archives, um, a lot of those folks are eager to help you look for what you're, um, what you're searching for. And I would also say growing up in the social media age, um, everyone has an archive. Facebook has Facebook memories are on this day. Instagram has literally your archive, uh, Snapchat, things like that. Um, even going through that, I mean, I have posts from 2011, 2010, and I felt, you know, different. I felt many different ways. And I would go to social media. There was a live journal website or Zanga, you know, and um, if you can still get those memories back, that's even important to, you know, dive within yourself or explore different themes that you might have had and going on and see how they've manifested later or seeing how it's actually more of a common denominator than you might have thought. Um, so you can also pull from things like that in your archive, too. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, the, for this presentation and for being here. I'm so impressed just by um, the intersection of a gallery space, a um, education space, art making space, um, and then um, the sort of space of vigil and protest, and how they all sort of like uh, 
really great uh, in, in, in your work. And I'm wondering if we could just talk about just, um, you know, discover it, like discovering some of those connections. Absolutely. So my nephew was killed on uh, September 26th of 2010. And when I think about that whole situation, um, not just his murder, but everything that followed it and everything that happened before that, um, I started looking at messages that he would send me, whether they were on text or whether they were on Facebook. And he would always connect with me and say, hey, auntie, I have a friend that's like a rapper and you know, you got to help them out because we had this company called Intrinsic Entertainment Group where I worked with a CPA and we would actually let artists know that they needed accounting and they needed to set up companies so that they wouldn't starve to death. And so <laughs> that was kind of my job. But in doing that work, you get to meet a lot of people. You get to travel. You're in the, you know, you're in the network with people that are actually publishing and distributing and merchandising their work. So my nephew saw that as a way for children to get out of the trauma that they were in, in his school and in the space that he lived in here in Portland. And so when he was murdered um, and, you know, obviously the community comes together, I saw all these children and all these different people. And I thought about all those different conversations and all those requests for help. And I thought that I would challenge myself to learn and to understand what the children needed so that their lives could be impacted by like an inheritance, right? And I thought that discovery through art was that inheritance because I saw what happened with people throughout history that, you know, trusted their their heart, you know, which is your art to me, and I always call it the heart of protest, but um, they trusted their heart to kind of communicate who they were and to assert their humanity. And so I wanted to make that accessible to children that were affected by violence and people in our community that wanted to be effective in communicating and building community through art. And so a lot of people still to this day are like, what does Don't You Portland have to do with, you know, arts and education? And I'm like, well, a banner saved my life. Like I was out there and I was in serious trauma and emotional trauma because of my nephew's death. And while I'm auditing the system and going to all these meetings and committees to testify and to do research, I also realized that if I had on something that was artistic or if I'm in the streets with a banner that, you know, was made by somebody that cared about why I was out there and was able to communicate through the art on that banner, um, that people would take a moment to listen and then they would contribute um, their own empathy or space or skill set to help me dismantle the system that was causing my heartbreak. <laughs> And so it only made sense for us to not only uh, create more art and to build installations where people could come in and see what we're talking about, but also to provide um, artworks and that same type of inspiration to people affected by violence so that they can find out what they have inside of them that can actually contribute to social change. And I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll give it to Todd. Hey, there's some chat. Oh, there you go. Right. More questions? I just really thank you for this work. And I have um, a, a question. How might institutions, other neighborhood community organizations, or businesses work more in solidarity with your work? was one or two things you would love to see more of our neighborhood partners doing in solidarity with don't you or black thank you um so the question was how can other institutions neighboring businesses and institutions and galleries support don't shoot portland and the black gallery um i'll let both of us answer this but for me to make it short um you know, I went over this in my presentation as a Black woman, um, as someone who is a survivor of all sorts of uh, systemic violence, I personally, we don't tend to apply for grants and things like that where it's for the organizing work. Uh, we would like to focus more on building arts and humanities. So any type of opportunities like that for support, for operational support, uh, keep us in mind for things like that because we are grassroots because we don't seek out federal funding. Um, 
in that way, you know, um, it, it's literally recurring donations and volunteers showing up and using their art to help us. Um, like Teresa was saying, you know, the banner that saved her life was, pre, you know, made by someone who had that vision to help support the messaging. Um, that says a lot. So we need the support of artists and patrons and lawyers and people mm -hmm. that support the vision and want to see it continue without us having to rely on structures that have failed us. Yeah. And some of what Ty was uh, connecting to, so we obviously we use art and education to communicate to the bigger public and to provide a resource to our community. But a lot of our work that we do on the daily is advocacy work. We're, we're in the trenches. We're right there with families that are affected by violence. And there's not a lot of funding that's out there for that type of work that's being done all year round. And sometimes when you apply for an arts grant, they just want you to make a piece of art and you have a certain amount of time to, but we will drop art to, advocate at any moment, you know, and especially if there's a need for like legal support or housing or a funeral even. And so for us, um, the most impactful way that institutions and that artists and, you know, different um, corporations or whatever can support us is by making us a social um, connection. Like it, it can't just be support when 2020 happens or when tragedy happens, because there's a lot of trauma connected with receiving uh, performative support, right? Because in 2020, we received a lot of support. Um, and what ended up happening was that we started sharing that support amongst our community, especially in the mutual aid communities, and then also supporting a lot of artists. But because that support wasn't consistent, it's not sustainable. And we don't want to wait for the next pandemic or the next tra tragedy to happen because we as an organization have never even fundraised when there's someone's death connected to that unless we're fundraising directly for the family. So we'll still continue to deliver on the things that we want to do in our community, but you have to know that we're doing it at a deficit. Um, and not only just the monetary deficit, we're, we're volunteering with our lives every day as much as we possibly can. Um, and we need more people to be impacted by the work in a way that they become volunteers in that work, even in their own communities, and not just leave it up to us as victim survivors of violence to show you what those contributions look like, but to make a conscious effort to look and seek change in the world and figure out where you are in your life and how you can contribute to something that makes social change possible. We all have it in us. Um, after the 2017 Max murders, I did months and months of bystander intervention, and I had to sit in front of people that were asking me, how do they stop a white supremacist from harming children? You know, like, what would I do? And, I'll, and I have always had to say, well, the same thing you would do if you saw someone abusing an animal, like you would tell them to stop, you would, you know, like, let everybody would let them know morally and ethically that it's wrong. But if you can see some children being harassed and intimidated and even assaulted um, by like a white supremacist and you feel inside your body that your own self bias um, contributes to that and you don't stop it, then that's not something I can help school you on. That's something that you have to deal with on your, on your own because I couldn't witness that without some kind of response. And I'm not saying put yourself at risk when you know that others are at risk. Um, but I'm saying be proactive in the way that you live in the society that we live in. Uh, make a conscious effort to live in a better world so that we can give that to our babies when it's time for them to take over. All right, do we have any other questions in the room? Yes. Thanks so much. I um, brought an art teacher that I worked with to your uh, last year's um, screen printing and then took those posters back to my high school's Black Student Union who used them as a part of the Black I I hope you know this, like that your ripple effects. Positively impacts so many people. So I, I know that you're probably constantly in the trenches and giving them yourself. 
but um, I hope you know that that your your work is really impactful and meaningful and and helps students impacted by racial violence um, express themselves and move forward um, in, in all of that. So I guess my question is, you've been doing this for such a long time and you have such stamina and you have <laughs> such respect in this community. How are we taking care of ourselves? <laughs> and I hope, I hope um, we can help with that. If there's if there's if there's a way, um, so there's there's that. Thank you for the question and the wonderful comment about your appreciation of our work. Um, art therapy is extremely important to us. And uh, as to your question of how we're taking care of ourselves and how you all could help with that, it's such a hard question. <laughs> it's like you know you just want the simple pleasures where you're able to like take a bath and like relax for a little bit or you know I've been indulging in art therapy when I can too and you know I kind of use that as my meditative practice but even a lot of it is very uh drip you know it's driven by violence and documentation you know so even that is not like it I like my deep diving brain to be stimulated but then it's not even like in a good way so um I would just say to be supportive um be supportive of volunteer run organizations like ours um you know support the work that we're doing to lighten the load a little bit and you know keep inviting us to spread the message as well i think partnerships are very important in sustaining the work and delegating the work so that it's not so heavy um and yeah and i'll just reiterate um take care of each other like we when we did the bystander interventions um, I found out through community conversations with hundreds of people that people didn't even know their neighbors. And so when people were reporting to us that they were at risk for like Nazism in their community, we realized that their neighbors knew who might be that person on the block, but they hadn't communicated that to other neighbors. And so when there are challenges and when there is violence in our community, when we do see something we don't only have to say those things to the authorities who a lot of times say that they don't have time to come out and investigate it, but be proactive in keeping your community safe and building like an anti-racist lens um, that operates that way. And again, don't put the burden of that work on the people most affected because obviously we're reliving and re-traumatized and we want relationships that don't include violence with our neighbors. We want to just be cared about or invited or just a part of our community without being someone's, you know, cop watch problem or, you know, something like that. And so let's lean that burden to communities that can operate easier that way. All right. I want to thank Ty and Teresa so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. Um, thank you all for coming um, online and in person. Um, our next program are the lightning talks, which begin at 12 p.m. Um, that is a separate Zoom link um, that you can find on Willamette's website on the Civic Commons page. Um, and we invite you to join us at 12. Thank you so much.